Greetings, and welcome to the Fall Home Gardener video series sponsored by the Sacramento Stormwater Quality Partnership. In this video, we will review the important role and, of beneficial insects and how to attract them into our gardens so that we can create a pest-free garden with these beneficial insects. And as the tagline says, let nature's arsenal manage your garden pests. My name is Sarah Sutton. I'm a landscape architect, a native to the California and the Bay Area, and um, am very excited to share this information with you. It's something I think that's very important for so many reasons. So let's get started. Before we dive into all the details, since we're talking about insects, good bugs and bad bugs, so to speak, I thought I'd start with a quote by the late, great E.O. Wilson. It's from a paper he wrote in 1997 called The Little Things That Run the World. If all mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. If insects were to vanish, however, the environment would collapse into chaos. And what he's saying here is that it's all connected. It's all about the food chain, the, the food web that you see depicted on the sketch to the right. And it starts with the plants and moves up to the herbivores, then the carnivores, the omnivores, and we're in there too. It's We're all related. So we need to find ways to not hurt the beneficials and let the pests that we don't want in our garden become food for all the predators we can attract. And there is a concern about biodiversity at all levels in California and globally, that it's decreasing at an alarming rate for so many reasons. And we don't need to be helping limit biodiversity by using chemicals and such. The native biodiversity in our, in our landscape at all levels is the key to resiliency. We need to bring back the native plants, the native animals, and keep them in our ecosystem. And we must prefer, preserve and support the food web services, these ecosystem services that all of the this rich ecology provides. So we need to keep it in balance. So this session will cover First of all, protecting our watersheds. And then we'll introduce integrated pest management. We'll talk about garden and landscape pests, beneficial insects, and other, other animals we can attract to our garden as a key strategy for integrated pest management. How to attract and retain the beneficial insects and other predators to your garden and landscapes. How many people have you heard say that they bought a bunch of uh, ladybugs and release them into their garden and they all disappeared. So we want to attract them naturally and make sure that we have what they're looking for. And then there'll be some other approaches I'll discuss to discourage and eliminate pests, both in your home and your garden. I'd like to start though, by talking about protecting our watersheds. Use of chemicals has impaired water bodies all over the world and all of the state, the Bay Area rivers and streams, mostly streams, uh, are listed as impacted from various chemicals that have been used over the years. And they do find their way into, directly into our streams and rivers by rain, irrigation. Um, and when they get into the storm drains, I don't think, not everybody knows this. I've met a couple people who were very surprised. The water that goes in our storm drain goes directly into the water bodies. There's no treatment. So whatever's in there is gonna get into the streams and ultimately down to the bays and the ocean. So using a non-chemical approach in our gardens, including beneficial insects and bugs and plants, protects our creeks and our water bodies that they lead to. And for more information on all this, do visit ourwaterourworld.org at the link down below. So integrated pest management. Uh, it's described as an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of pests and their damage through a combination of techniques such as biological control, habitat ma manipulation, modification of cultural practices, and uh, using plant resistant varieties of plants, uh, pest resistant varieties of plants. So uh, with integrated pest management, you start at the bottom of that pyramid and look at how you're taking care of your garden, the cultural, then you use physical and mechanical approaches to eliminate or remove or prevent the bugs or whatever pests are coming into your space. There are biological controls that can be another measure of defense. And finally, if none of that works and things are really out of control, there are 
chemical solutions, but that's as a last resort and only using those that are least toxic and the least persistent to provide adequate control. But the goal is to never get there in the first place. Now there are five steps of integrated pest management. The first one is identify the pest. You'd be surprised how many people think some of the beneficial bugs in our gardens are actually something that we will eat our vegetables or damage our garden plants. So once you've determined it is indeed a pest, then monitor and see if it's naturally declining on its own, if it was just one or two and that's it, is it a seasonal issue, uh, or is it really becoming a real infestation, such as this picture here where ants actually do farm aphids. They protect the aphids and in return they get this honeydew that the aphids secrete after sucking the sap out of our plants. And the ants just love it. So they work very hard to protect the aphids and keep them in your garden. So then determine action thresholds. At what point is enough enough? Sometimes you could tolerate a little damage, you could tolerate a little bit of a problem. Um, and again, as I said, sometimes it's just seasonal. Or have you reached a point where this is out of control and if we don't do something, it's going to eat my vegetables or eat up my prize flowers. So you do start with the least toxic, stay away from chemicals only as a last resort, and then evaluate results. This is really important because it's a cycle. You want to start it and then evaluate and then learn each time. And you'll find that you will learn some of the cycles in your garden that naturally correct themselves. There are a lot of challenges with chemicals and both to ourselves, to our children, to our pets. And a lot of articles you could read about that in the resources. But most importantly, if you are going to use a chemical, check the label and get a hold of the material product safety sheet. Really important to do that. On the bottom right is an example of a label I got from the Our Water, Our World website. And the EPA requires that they list very prominently, so you can see the bold letters, it says danger, warning, and caution. Caution is low toxicity, although I have to say, well, how low is low, right? It's still toxic. Um, then there's the warning, which is moderately toxic. Again, what does that mean? And then there's the highly toxic, which I would stay away from at all, all costs in my house, in my garden. You don't need to go there. So once you've looked at that and you read, read the, how to use the product properly, sometimes there's a danger that people don't read the label and they just start spraying indiscriminately. And the second thing is you need to protect yourself. If you look at the upper right, there is a copy of a product material safety sheet and from a common, a common uh, pesticide or herbicide that's used in the gardens. And I put a red box around protecting protection and exposure control. And it work, very strongly recommends that you wear goggles, you wear full, completely cover your body, long pants, long sleeves, shoes, gloves, and then when you wash them, it even says wash them separately, keep them separate from everything else in your laundry. So that's telling you some things about the product and what you need to be careful for. And how many people do you see out in the garden in the middle of the summer with their flip-flops and their shorts and their hat, and they're just using their little sprayer, trying to get rid of the weeds. So be very careful. And also speaking of sprays, where do your kids play? Do they play in the dirt? So do you wanna really be putting chemicals on the dirt as they? crawl around and dig with their Tonka trucks or their little matchbox trucks, or even some kids just like to stuff dirt in their mouths. So uh, really need to be careful. And then the pets as well. There are lots of data on the impact of some of these chemicals on the pets. I've mentioned water pollution. It's worth mentioning again. And also air pollution. It doesn't take much. It's just a gust of wind for whatever's being sprayed to come up into your face for you to in inhale it. There are recommendations for what to do if you do inhale any of these chemicals. Uh, I would wear a mask, frankly. Um, so you wanna make sure that, again, you're not exposing anyone, pets, animals, kids. If it gets into the watershed, it can, eat, it can impact fisheries. And there are two it's relatively uh, popular biologic controls, Bacillus thuringis, or BT, and pyrethrins. And there are problems with those based on some of the research I've read that the Bt is a naturally occurring bacterium found in the soils all over the world. And to reproduce, it produces spores. And if uh, insects or insect larvae eat the spores, it can be toxic to them. 
And because it's a natural source, they call it a biopesticide, but it's still a pesticide. And they generally tend to, to pose fewer risks, but they specifically say everything I've read that it's also toxic to nematodes. And there are really good nematodes we need to keep in our soils that attack a lot of the other microorganisms that could cause problems if less, left unchecked. The other one is the pyrethrin, which is comes from chrysanthemums, a certain uh, species of chrysanthemum. And if the material, it, it will if it breaks down in sunlight in a few hours, it's considered inert. But if it's damp, if it somehow ends up in the waterways, then it can be toxic to birds, fish, and beneficial insects. So if you're using an insecticidal soap or uh, any material, you want to be very, very careful how you apply it and where you use it. So again, with integrated pest management, that's a last resort. We want to try to do things differently. And then any of these chemicals aren't can't be guaranteed to be specific just to one pest. And there are a lot of beneficial insects that can be very sensitive as well. And then you're actually damaging the insects that you want to keep in your garden, which makes it easier for the pests to come back in. So again, we're thinking holistically, ecologically. So sometimes people say, well, what is a pest? What is a garden pest, a landscape pest? And it's a nuisance, destructive to our garden, agriculture, plants, and or carry disease. And that would include any plants, commonly known as weeds. And it's the joke is uh, a weed really is just a plant where you don't want it. There are lots of weeds that grow in nature just fine, and they provide a lot of benefits. Uh, it's a vertebrate or invertebrate, all different types of birds, rodents, mammals, um, insects, etc. cetera. Uh, nematodes and pathogens in our soil, the little small microscopic. And it's if it's one that causes disease or a, an unwanted organism that may harm water quality or animal life or other parts of the ecosystem, and there are a lot of invasive species that have come into our environment from uh, other parts of the country, other parts of the world. And sometimes if they're left unchecked, then they do create a serious problem. So in your garden, learn to recognize the garden pests. And the first one is the aphids on the top left, which that I would call a very disturbing uh, population of aphids on the plant. And there are ways, mechanical ways, knock them off, spray them with the hose. Uh, you don't need to go for the can of raid in that case. Uh, Japanese beetles, turns out, aren't in the Western states yet, but there are very strict quarantine rules. That's why many of the plants can't be imported from certain areas because of the, of the, uh, if the how difficult that the beetle is on the landscapes back east. Cutworms, if you've ever planted seedlings, for your vegetable garden and cutworms come out at night and they dis munch on the right at the base of the plant or just underneath the surface. So one of the best ways to prevent any problems that I've read about in lots and lots of different garden books, they always recommend the same thing. Just get a uh, either a paper cup or a quart milk carton made with the waxy, waxy paper material cardboard and create a sheath that you bury in the ground about an inch or so and then you leave it up above as well and that'll keep them from getting to the food that they're looking for. Slugs and snails, we all know what they look like and you've seen the damage they can do. So the first thing is just to eliminate places where they hide and they like shady, damp places. So this is where garden, garden cleanup, garden hygiene is really important. Uh, and then there are lots of ways to discourage them, get rid of them. I know people who like to harvest them, feed them cornmeal, and then they make escargot and it's a, uh, very tasty way to enjoy your snails if you like that. Um, and, then, and then I'll say more about some other techniques. Spider mites, you may never see, but you might see the webs. They're very fine filamental webs, but you'll also very possibly see they suck the leaves. And so you'll start seeing little streaky areas where the leaf is being uh, sucked dry, so to speak. So uh, apparently in uh, orchards, they can become more prominent when it's hot and dusty. Something about that attracts them. So they, they recommend that you hose off your plants maybe once a month or so just to keep the dust down if you have that problem where you live. And um, you can also, if you think if you have them, just do a more forceful spray on the underside as well as the top. It will eliminate most of the population and that might be enough to just keep them at bay. Squash bugs, 
are about five eighths of an inch long. So that you could actually see them and they like squash and animals in the squash family, I mean plants in the squash family. And you, the hygiene is probably the best thing here as well. They like to hang in damp, moist places underneath a rotting uh, squash plant or one that's fallen underneath the, uh, the big leaves. So keep things clean and airy and they will probably not become a massive pest and catch them early. Now I've never seen a flea beetle, but apparently they can jump. And that's, if you see a little black shiny beetle that jumps, a tiny one that jumps off your plant, then that might be what you have. And um, the best way to control them is again, just to keep your garden clean, hose them off if you need to. The cucumber beetle, there's two kinds and they do like cucumbers and other cucumber family vegetables. Um, they're active. Usually they don't like heat and they don't and they do like moisture so they come out at night most of the time so if it's a hot hot day they will be hiding and you want to again keep your garden clean now earwigs oh they scared me when i was a kid look at how they did something about them with their little pinchers uh, and i had to learn that they really were harmless they don't chase children down and pinch them uh, they're most active at night and they like dark damp places like a lot of these beetles do they can be devastating on seedlings and your garden flowers, tender things, soft fruit, real disappointing to see them chewing on some of the fruit. Usually they go after the ones that are on the ground, but they can get up in the trees too. Uh, but one thing about them is they're a very active predator towards aphids. So keep a lookout for them and see if where they are, there are some aphids around and maybe you just let them stay, don't bother them. And one way to capture them is to roll up a piece of newspaper and leave it out on your driveway where it'll get damp at night and they will very often they'll crawl in and you can pick it up and dispose of it without uh, pretty simple and easy to do and then of course gophers those gophers can be awfully awfully disturbing and the problem with using any sort of poison is that any mammal that ha is a predator of a gopher will also be poisoned if they eat it and i have a friend's cat that came in and was frothing at the mouth and other symptoms. And you could tell that something was really wrong and it, it died within a half an hour. And we found evidence of, an, of a half eaten gopher outside. So don't let that happen to your pets. And the best way to get rid of them is to use traps. That's what a lot of the city of San Francisco has been very successful with traps and then uh, other cities as well. And the other thing is uh, just get cages for your plants. And I make my own using rabbit mesh. That's that one half inch grid galvanized. And I kind of make an origami type box that I clip together with some wire pieces and give it a lot of room. And that takes care of any possible problem. They just keep looking and looking, but they can't get into those. So now we're gonna get into three very common household pests that people always want to know what to do with and really don't want to use chemicals and sprays in the house, which I, and I totally agree with that. The thing about ants is not all of them are actually pests. Some just wander in and disappear. They usually come in to a building looking for shelter. If it's a really hot, hot day, or if it's really wet, they want a place that's dry. They're always looking for food all, and if you have anything that's any crumbs, any things that have dropped on the floor that you didn't see, they will look for that. And if they get established as a colony, either under your house or nearby, they're really difficult to control. So the first thing though, is to identify the species, which you can by looking at this chart, you go to the uh, UC Ag and Natural Resources website, the ipm.ucanr.edu, it's listed down below. Every question you have or possibly have about any kind of garden pest, beneficials, et cetera, is gonna be found on that website. So you find out what you have and you'll get some specific recommendations. But in my, my experience over the years, the first thing is monitor and inspect frequently. If, you, if you're, you know you get ants in your house from time to time, so just look for them. And then the second thing is close off any cracks that you find around your foundation or places around windows where they just, they seem to be consistently getting in sanitize, keep your food tightly closed, refrigerated, even just leaving something out uh, for an hour or so while you go do something else and then come back, you may find that you've got some ants having a really nice feast. Uh, non-toxic contact sprays, I use Murphy's oil soap. 
I thought, well, it's citrus and it's oily and it's non-toxic. I sprayed it on a trail of ants. It stopped them in the, their spot. And it also helps uh, create the scent, confuses them when they're trying to follow their own little community trails. And that works really well. And then you can make bait traps online. It's usually boric acid, sugar, and water. You uh, heat it up a bit and put it into, I use old empty spice jars with glass jars with uh, the lids that pop up and the little openings. So you lay it sideways. You don't want your pets to get into it. It'll make them sick. It won't be fatal. And the ants will come in. They'll eat it. They're attracted by the sugar. They go back to the nest and they share and it slowly can diminish a colony if there's a problem. But it takes time. So you have to be a, be a, really careful with it and really pay attention. So roaches, fortunately, I have never had to deal with in my home, but I've seen them in restaurants. I have seen them in uh, old hotels and apartments, you know, old, old buildings. And they usually come in from where, the, where there are dumpsters and it's multifamily housing or multifamily lodging. And as big dumpsters and they're attracted to the garbage and then they find their way up the walls. And before you know it, they find a, they find a place they like and they stick around. So, um, and they do carry germs from sewers and garbage and such. So you really don't want them around. Their droppings can cause asthma and allergies. So um, they are really bad news. So the first thing is get a sticky trap, get a bunch of them. And best kind that have pheromones because that attracts more of them, right? To come check out what's going on. And then there are two things that happen. You see how many you have to deal with, and then you also can identify the type of approach that it might be. Again, that might make a difference in how you, you ultimately get rid of the roaches. But you wanna keep everything super, super clean. The droppings alone attract more cockroaches. So gotta just get out there and clean, vac with a vacuum with a HEPA filter. Diatomaceous earth is considered the, the first line of defense if you need to use some kind of a, a chemical, so to speak, but not the kind that you get in your pool. You want to get the, the stronger variety of diatomaceous earth that's pest grade. And then there are enclosed baits, either with boric acid or hydromethylon, and you want to make sure that they are enclosed, again, so that your pets and other curious critters don't get in there. Over and, but you really have to attack it. If you've got them, you've got to get right on it and really clean up. And that's Hygiene, more than anything for roaches, is the most important. Storing your food, sealing containers, keeping your counters, eating areas, floors clean daily, taking out the garbage and recycling every night. Um, you don't need to take out the paper, but anything that's got food material in it. This is a, a tip that I didn't think about because I don't have uh, dogs or cats. But if you take their pet foods and their water bowls and you put them in a bigger bowl with soapy water, that'll keep the uh, roaches from getting to them. I've tried it with ants and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, you need to reduce clutter in rooms. It creates hiding places. Keep your kitchen surfaces dry. They don't like, they like dampness. So you wanna be dry. If you've got leaky plumbing, that could be something that attracts them too. Make sure that gets fixed. Weather strip and seal cracks, really shut them out. Don't let them in. And then keep putting out sticky traps. If you've had a problem, you have to monitor on a constant, constant basis. So that if one or two or three come in, you catch them right away and you can double down on getting rid of them. So I hope you never experience this, but this is a highly recommended way to deal with them. You don't need the chemicals, the harsh stuff. And there's more information at the Our Water, Our World website. And the third least favorite um, pest, are the rodents, the rats. I have a friend who said, oh, they're just mice. I got mice, I, you know, and then I happened to see one run by and thought, nope, that is not a mouse, that is a rat. Uh, and you could hear them chewing at night, chewing on wood. Uh, you often don't see them. I was surprised, they were pretty bold. Uh, usually you just see the droppings and the evidence that they've been around and chewing on things. So the first thing you wanna do is seal up all possible ways that they get into the house, but they don't need a lot of room. And they like to hide behind furnaces and hot water heaters in places that are nice and warm and cozy. And they'll gather up whatever they can to make a cusk, a nice little uh, comfortable nest for themselves. Uh, and you have to get rid of all food, water, shelter, anything. Just don't let them have find a place to stay and be happy. The best way to get rid of them is the snap traps. And usually 
you need to hire a professional because they've had the experience and they can see where they have the damage is, see where they've been, and they can uh, set them in the appropriate locations to trap them. And eventually all of the ones that were in her house got trapped and removed and they haven't been back. She's done everything we recommended here. And uh, the, UC, the IPM website at the UC Ag and Natural Resources website has a lot of good information on this. So hopefully you'll never have problems with those three. So now we're gonna get back to the garden and uh, talk about beneficial insects, because as I called it earlier on nature's arsenal, there are all kinds of bugs and other, other predators out there. Uh, the difference between a predator and a parasitoid, uh, predators attack and damage, eat, whatever it is they're going after. Where parasitoids, mostly wasps and flies, will lay their eggs in, in the pest that you're trying to get rid of. And then they, they will die from the inside out. Sounds like something out of a science fiction movie. You know, remember <laughs> um, Alien, you know, once they hatch, they come out the bug, but the bug's already dead at that point. So uh, they're really helpful to have around. And before we go to talk about the good bugs, I wanted to say a few words about pollination. We absolutely need to improve our pollinator population all over the state, all over the country. It's actually, it's a global problem. I'm sure you're aware of that. And it's not just honeybees. We have 2,000 native bee species in California alone, plus lots of other insects, birds, and even bats help with pollination. So we need to think holistically and make sure that we're always doing what we can to keep the pollinators around as well. So this is a great poster. I cut it in half so it would fit on the slide. Um, but you can download your own poster at the website link there. And these are the, the most common paras, para, predators and parasitoids. And you want to make sure you recognize them in the garden and welcome them in your garden. And we'll talk a little bit more about what they're attracted to so, to make them happy. So the top predators, parasitoids, there's 14 of them on that chart. Uh, the lady beetle, I still call them ladybugs. It's just what I learned when I was a kid. Um, they're known for eating aphids. But the green lacewing is also a really prolific um, aphid eater, uh, as well as leafhoppers and mites and psyllids and everything else that they list there. And they're really pretty. And I have seen them in my garden. You see them on your flowers or on your vegetable crops. And so just when you see it, welcome it and say, go go make some more. Go have some babies. Um, predaceous ground beetles, the big and they're black. I see them scurrying around all the time. And they go after those cabbage worms, earthworm, or earworms, worms and other beetle slugs, and apparently they even eat weed seeds. So they provide a real mix of benefits. There's the damsel bug. Look at that long, skinny thing. It's kind of interesting looking, isn't it? Uh, and they eat a lot of prey. Soldier beetles, I've seen those around a lot. They are long, and they've got the red on the sides, and they uh, stand out really uh, distinctly in your garden. Then, of course, spiders are good. They'll, they'll feed on roaches, earwigs, mosquitoes, etc., and other spiders, other insects. And some of these predators will eat the beneficial insects too. I mean, that's not a, they're not focused on just the bad bugs. And so that's why we want a balance and we want to maintain a real healthy garden that attracts all of these. The hoverfly, have you seen those in the garden? They're very tiny and they hover like little helicopters and they have never seen them do anything but just maybe land on a flower and consider it and then fly away. But apparently they prey on aphids too, which are pretty big for their size, um, and cabbage worms, mealybugs, the predatory wasps. This is the kind that will lay eggs on the different um, different, pre different prey, different um, pests. And the praying mantids are completely harmless to all of your plants, and they eat lots and lots of insects, good and bad. So uh, you want to make sure that you keep, again, a balance in your garden. And then the pirate bug is really, really tiny and mainly just eats the smaller insects and larvae. Uh, you might not even see those because of their size. And uh, four more, the thrips, six-spotted thrips, the western predatory mites. They feed on spider mites and uh, areophids. Dragonflies, they go after mosquitoes and gnats and flies and termites and ants 
And it makes sense that they go after mosquitoes. They hang around ponds. And you notice how they always come over and they like the water supply as well. And then the assassin bug apparently is the champion. So take a good look at that one. You want that one in your garden. They are very voracious and will eat anything they come across. So now you've met 14 of them. And well, how do you attract them? How do you keep them? So you want to plant beneficial insect plants. And this is a good time to mention this fall series has three presentations. There's this one. There's one on beneficial plants. We get more into the plant aspect of it and more about who, who they attract. And then the one, there's another one on your garden and hot heat gardens and how to, how to protect yourself and your garden. So back to this slide. I like this chart. I cut it in half to make it fit on the slide. It's from Cornflower Farms. I'll show you the link on another slide. But what they show is what's the beneficial insects? And see, you see some of the ones we mentioned. What are the major pests that they go after? And then what plants will attract them to your garden? And notice that the milkweed is listed on a number of those columns. And the uh, it's not just for the butterflies. It is very good for butterflies and especially the monarchs go after a one or two specific species. And I saw three of those soldier bugs in on one of these ones. And the tachnid fly, I didn't mention that. It's not on the other chart, but apparently it is one of the most important predatory insects to have in your garden. And if you look at this, you'll notice that a yarrow, achillea, and eriogonum, the uh, buckwheat, and ceanothus are listed multiple times. So I always make sure, and bacris too. So use this as a starting point. Start adding these plants into your garden and, and see if you notice visitors. You need to provide year-round blooms for pollinators and for beneficial insects. Because if they're going to stay around your garden, there's got to be something for them to enjoy, some, some nectar, or, and they need shelter. So here's a listing from the Cornflower Farms website that shows how these plants overlap in their blooming season, providing a steady stream of, of food and resources. Now, there are other predators you might want to attract into your garden. Amphibians and reptiles are amazing at eating things, especially on the ground. And the hummingbirds, birds, even bats fly and forage. Birds will forage for all kinds of grubs. They love worms and caterpillars, and in fact, they need them to rear their young. We talk about that in the plants section. Hummingbirds will eat ants and aphids and fruit flies and ants, weevils, beetles. Uh, more than just the nectar that they get from the feeder or from your flowers. And what I've observed is we have a hummingbird feeder in our garden, but we also have hummingbird plants and they visit everything. They don't just stick with the, the water. You, all of these animals are going to need food, water, and shelter. Boulders, logs, places to hide. Now again, places to hide also are places where your predators can hide. So you have to be judicious about what you, what you provide and how you provide it. There's bat boxes you can get. A toad abode is basically a flower pot turned sideways and buried halfway in the ground a little dish of water outside and toads will find those and they'll be very happy. Hummingbirds like safe perches where they can see what's going on, see the predators that might be flying in their way. And then native plants, especially for the birds, they need the berries. So think about that as you're choosing your plants. Now there are other ways to discourage and eliminate pests as well. And one of them is just to keep a, a row of gravel right around the edge of the house. Don't have a place for them to hide. You no know, plants, shady, shady plants in nice and moist spots where they can hang out and then go into the house. It also provides fire protection. If, you, if you're in a fire prone area, you need a five foot perimeter of that. And I, this is not the most attractive solution there. You can use more attractive aggregates around your house, but this was available to us at our place and that's what we used. You wanna clean up your debris piles and keep them away from your house and keep them away from your vegetable garden and just make sure they're not getting out of control and attracting uh, predator, um, pests into your garden. There are traps and barriers and other mechanical controls you can use. And you've heard about beer and a pie tin for slugs and snails. And I found this great blog at theseedcollection.com on how to build a beer trap using a plastic water bottle that you bury into the ground and fill it up below ground level with some beer. And then you take cut two little openings and fold them back 
to create a ramp for the, the slugs and snails to go up and then they go in and then they can't get out. So I thought I'd try that. I start to have a problem. Go for cages, I already mentioned, and the sticky traps. And there's a lot of recipes for homemade soapy garlic water and similar mixes that you can make that's completely non-toxic, but is effective on a lot of the pests that might show up in your garden, especially your pretty flowers and tender, tender greens and your vegetables that you want to protect. And there are pest repellent plants. You find a good list here at this link. And I remember a neighbor when I was growing up, she surrounded her vegetable garden with marigolds for that very reason. It really did help keep a lot of these predatory insects or pest insects out of her garden. So here's a list of resources. The first three on this topic are really, really valuable. The uh, Stormwater Quality Partnership, beriverfriendly.net. Our Water, Our World, lots of great information. They've been around for decades. The UC Agricultural Natural Resources website. I've already mentioned how that is a tremendous resource. Uh, then the EPA, and there's another link from the uh, invasive, uh, invasive and exotic pests from the uh, UCNAR webs website. And another one, okay, I won't read that one, but that's a great link. I was enjoying that. You can find more resources by going back to page where you logged into this presentation. And you can also watch other educational videos from this season and previous seasons at the beriverfriendly.net video series. So I hope you found this interesting and useful and you're empowered to go out and take care of your garden and bring all those wonderful bugs into your garden. So thank you for watching.